Only thing I'm plugging is Forgotten Seasons. Welcome back to another episode of Forgotten Seasons. Today, we got Amari Stoudemire. Stat, how you doing today? Feeling good, brother. Feeling good. Well, first off, I want to congratulate you for being inducted into the Suns Ring of Honor. Uh, doing my research in the Suns blogs, they, they felt it was long overdue. First off, how was the feeling when you got the call from Matt Ishbia? And then secondly, what what took so long? Well, I was actually uh, enjoying my son's birthday uh, okay. when I got the call from Matt. And Matt was like, hey, I got some exciting news for you. And at the moment, I was like, okay, this this seems pretty surprising. And then he was like, uh, we, we're going to you know induct you into the um, – to the ring of honor, we're going to retire your jersey number 32. And I was like overly excited. Um, I got the call on my son's birthday. My son's my namesake, and my name will be in the Raptors forever. So that was a, a beautiful moment for me. That's incredible. Not, I, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what, what took so long. I mean, obviously it was um under different ownership at that time. Um, but I did talk to the previous owner, and he also mentioned that he was going to retire my jersey but just wasn't sure when that was going to happen. Um, so, you know, everything happens for a reason that always at a point in time. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm happy for Suns fans and the Suns organization. I mean, without getting too much into it, it seems like a cloud has been lifted and Matt seems great. I know Isaiah is super involved and they wasted no time making moves once they came in. Yeah, it was beautiful, man. I know I, tr I truly enjoyed the moment. My family is very excited about it. So I, I want to start talking about your career in the spring of 2005 uh it's funny i was in springfield this past week watching dirk and pow get inducted into the hall of fame i think you're soon to follow but starting you know starting with your career in 2005 the spring of 2005 in the playoffs i mean the numbers just jump off the board and i, I don't really think people understand just how special that run was for you 22 years old this is your third year in the league and you go through Pau Gasol's Grizzlies in round one. You go through Dirk's Mavs in round two. And the Spurs, who end up winning the championship, do get the best of you. But you break a record, uh, 37 points per game. You break Kareem's record for the most points per game in a conference finals by a first-timer. I mean, those numbers are, are, are absolutely incredible. The best you can, can you kind of take us back to who a 22-year-old Amari Stoudemire was and what his mindset was going up against the best power forwards in the game in the playoffs and not only going up against them, but dominating. Yeah. I mean, like you said, bro, I was 22 years old, right? I was only three years in a kid fresh out of high school. And so I was, you know, eager to, to take on the league and really uh, kind of make my, my imprint on, on the NBA. And so my mindset was, you know, playoffs is where stars, superstars are made, right? I had a pretty, I had a very decent, really good regular season that year. But mm -hmm. then I figured the playoffs is when you can take the next step and become a superstar and wanted to dominate, wanted my name to be to be known as the next generation guy. And so first round, we faced the, the Grizzlies. Paul Gasol was in his prime. He was uh, hard to guard. You know, he, he was a phenomenal, phenomenal player, even even them in his young career. Mm -hmm. I was able to to have my way somewhat with them. But I, you know, playoffs is about strategically planning. And so as a team, we 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 was able to win that series. Um, and then going up the next following se uh, series against Dirk, and Dirk is one of the hardest players I ever had to guard. I really couldn't guard him. He was a remarkable offensive juggernaut. Um, and but uh but I was able to have my way also uh with him. I was just too quick, too powerful, too explosive uh for those guys to to handle me. And then once we got to the Spurs, the Spurs was a well oiled machine led by Coach Popovich, who's a Hall of Fame coach and and so Tim Duncan was was a player that I had on my radar for as I wanted to show the world that I can compete with him and if not be better than him. Um, and so I took that series personally and I was able to 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 put on an incredible run uh, in the Western Conference Finals. I read that Tim Duncan gave you a lot of props after that series. You mentioned that you kind of had him circled coming up. Do you remember any conversations you had during or after that series just between you guys? No, I mean, I, I, we, we've, we, you know, Tim don't really say much in the basketball court, you know, and plus in the playoffs, neither do I, you know, it's just a matter of just focusing in and being truly determined to try to win the series. Uh, but I think after the series, the respect from both parties was, was mutual. Um, um, for me to average, you know, 37 points in the conference finals as a 22 year old, uh, was, was, was an incredible run. I mean, sometimes coaches came to me after the series and said, Mark, do you know what you just did? 
Like, do you know what you accomplished? And I had no idea. I was just a young player. And everything was happening so fast, and I was just trying to make my presence felt, but it was definitely a historic run. Mm. So we jumped to the, the playoffs. I want to zoom back out a little bit. Just talk about the 2005 season, a historic season. This is obviously the birth of seven seconds or less. Uh, do you remember at at a certain point what your guy's record was like midway through the season? Do you remember the, the best record that you have? Because I, I have it. I'm just wondering like it, if you remember what it was. Man, I, I, I don't. I know we went on a 12-game winning streak at one point. We uh, maybe lost one and then went on another winning streak. Um I mean, it was it was an incredible run. I don't know what our best record was at during that during that season, but it was it wasn't even it wasn't even close to what we were doing to other teams. It was thirty and four at, at one point, and it, <laughs> and it wasn't like you know a few balls bounce your ways or the the other team got lucky. Like you were destroying teams. I, I read a quote during that time from you, or maybe it was a little bit after where you said you would describe to your friends, like it was playing a, like playing a video game on easy. I mean, it, you were destroying teams. This is also like 2004, 2005, where, you know, you remember like the Pacers Pistons conference finals where the final score was like 65 to 55. You were putting up 120, 130 points per game. Uh, obviously you're a big part of that. This is Steve Nash's first year over from Dallas. Uh, Joe Johnson, Quentin Richardson, Sean Marion. What was that experience like in the regular season where, because I, I, I've also talked to Quentin Richardson about this season, and it's like you guys would go back into the locker room after games and be like, I mean, yeah, that just happened. W what, what was that just like whole experience like for you guys? It, it, I have, I'm having chills now, bro, just yeah. thinking about it, man, how incredible that run was. It was, it, it was remarkable. You know, we had just brought Steve into Phoenix. I was still in my second or second or third year uh in the NBA. We had very, very um uh, intelligent young talent when Joe Johnson and Sean Marion was already established as a as a, as an elite player. And so we all were very versatile. Sean Marion was probably the fastest player I ever played with. And he played the small forward and then he moved to power forward. I was one of the fastest and quickest big men in the league at that time, uh, as a young player. And Steve Nash was a soccer guy who kept himself in amazing shape and his vision was incredible. He was able to somewhat find us in the right spots and we were able to somewhat utilize our talent to the, to the, to the ultimate level. And so because of it, because we were so versatile and so fast and so energetic, the NBA really had no idea what was happening. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you know, you have, you have Steve who's, who's, you know, eyes behind his head. And then you have two guys on the wing with, with Stoudemire and Nash or, or, or Mary who are, outrunning everybody and doesn't seem to get tired. Um, the league wasn't keeping up with that. And fourth quarter come along and those guys are grabbing their shorts and they're leaning over, breathing hard. And meanwhile, we're like, bring it on. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. We were just, we just had all the energy and, 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 and I was attacking the rim with force and, and it was tremendous power. And Sean was out rebounding guys and defending the best offensive player. It, it was, it was remarkable. How good was Joe Johnson at that time? Because he he ends up leaving the next season. He signs a big deal in Atlanta, gets his money, gets his own team. I think people forget in that playoff run, he gets hurt, a really nasty like face fracture, I believe. It was at the end of the Dallas series, and then he misses the first two games of the Spurs series. How good was Joe Johnson? Did you kind of see him evolving into a superstar? What, what was your observations of him at that time? We got to give Joe a lot of credit because Joe was arguably one, maybe one of our best defenders on the perimeter between him and Sean. And he was arguably one of our best one-on-one -on -one offensive guys. So anytime the, anytime the ball stopped and we needed to get a basket, we would go to Joe Johnson and he'll just break his man down and either get a shot off or get to the basket. I mean, so he was, he was very, very important to what we were doing and, and his, his skill set was, was imperative for us. Um, and then the year he left, we really missed him because he was our guy. And plus, him and I are very close in age, and we were, we were, you know, close friends at that at that at that point in time. But that year was incredible. He had a, I think, a orbitable fracture that he suffered in the playoffs, which hurt us going into that Spurs series. Football fans, it is the last weekend of the year to place your bets. In honor of Super Bowl 58, I've teamed up with DraftKings Sportsbook to give you a shot at the crown. All new customers sign up using my code Forgotten Seasons, bet just $5 on any wager, and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. You heard that right. 
Bet $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. Make sure you sign up using my code Forgotten Seasons. With those $200 in bonus bets, you can place your very own same game parlay, combine multiple bets from the same game for a shot at an even bigger payout. If sports betting isn't available in your state yet, you can still get in on the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy, where they've got cash prizes up for grabs every single day. So what are you waiting for? Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use my code Forgotten Seasons. New customers bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code Forgotten Seasons, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. So again, you lose to the Spurs. Uh, The team after that, like I said, Joe goes to Atlanta. Q Rich gets traded to the Knicks. So that group really isn't able to run it back. And then obviously you run into some injury problems. Uh, I, I want to hear your perspective and, and just feelings about microfracture surgery, because in my research, it opened up like a pretty fascinating history of the microfracture surgery. It's a nasty sounding surgery. They drill into your knee to basically extract blood, which I guess forms a new type of cartilage. This is a surgery that effectively ended the careers of guys like T-Mac, Jamal Mashburn, Chris Weber. You were still able to go on and have a Hall of Fame career. But just going back and reading what you were saying, you didn't even know that you were going to have microfracture surgery basically until you woke up from it. What was the initial diagnosis? What were they laying out to you? And then a little later, I just want to get into what the recovery was like, because you also said that was probably the hardest point of your career coming back from that. Yeah, um, it was very difficult for me after having an incredible regular season and then a historical playoff run. Uh, the following training camp, I felt this discomfort uh, in my knee, and I didn't know what that was. So I went and saw the team doctor. Uh, he wanted to do a quick evaluation, and he mentioned that uh, we could do an orthoscopic scope, just go in and try to you know, see what's in there, what was bothering you, um, or it could be a microfracture uh, surgery that's needed. So I was like, what is a microfracture? I've never heard of this name before. I had to Google and see what that meant. I didn't know anything about it. Um, and then so... We came to the agreement that, okay, we're going to have a procedure. We're not sure if it's going to be a scope or a microfracture, and we won't know until after I get in, or the doctor gets in there and take a look. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I said, okay, fine. you know. And, and, and so we uh, went under, basically, the doctor, Dr. Thomas Carter, was going into the procedure, and I woke up from the, from the procedure and said, well, we, we actually did a microfracture, and it's very small of a, of a of a lesion. It's not, you know, you should better recover 100% from it, but it's going to take some time. And I was like, well, how long is it going to take? Like, it may take 8 to 12 months. What? Huh. 8 to 12 months? <laughs> what, did they, what, what, what did they tell you before the surgery? Was it supposed to be one of the options was just like kind of a cleanup, like cleaning up some cartilage, which would have been yeah. like, you know, you would have been back in maybe a few months? Yeah, that was that was the that was the hopeful idea, and I was leaning more toward that. I thought that was going to be what was going to happen, uh, but because I the the what, the, the, uh, what I got from the doctor was saying because I was so young and it's not a very big lesion that you know doing it now will be beneficial. Post doing it later on uh, because I have a higher chance of recovering, my body will heal faster, and these things. And so I, I wasn't agree with I was in agreement with it. You know, after I woke up, and so I had to go through excruciating uh, recovery. I mean, excruciating, bro. I mean, it took it took months on months. There were times where I thought I'd come up at a retirement. I'm like, I just cannot do this. I could. It was just it was just so bad. Uh, my family, the training staff at the time, which is led by Aaron Nelson and uh, assistant trainer Mike Elliott, and those guys in Phoenix were very positive toward me. They were like, "Stat, you can do this, man. Stay with it. Just follow our lead." We got you, bro. Don't worry. And so I, I took I took all my lack of confidence out of the equation, and I was able to attack my my recovery and my training with extreme focus. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, very very detail oriented, all the way to the to the smallest detail. And thank God I was able to recover, make first team All NBA, play eighty two mm-hmm. games, which is unheard of nowadays. I don't think mm-hmm. anyone plays eighty two games nowadays. <laughs> but to play eighty two games after a micro fracture. Uh, was was a blessing for sure. 
I mean, that's got to be listed up with all the all NBAs and all star appearances. The fact that 82 right after a micro fracture, do they is micro fracture not a thing anymore? Like, do they not practice it or do you not know? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I think I really I really don't think it's a thing anymore. I don't think a lot of people have it anymore. It's not even heard of at the moment. Mm -hmm. Well, like you said, you, you rebound first team all NBA 2007. Some people think that this was the best Suns team. I'm interested to hear your perspective. A lot of the reason why they say that is because of the trio of you, Marion, and Boris Diaw, who who was there. Pretty much everything you would need in a big man between you three. I mean, you, you're all very <clears throat> versatile players, can play both sides of the ball. Great athlete. I mean, you and Marion probably more so than Boris. No disrespect. Great athletes. <laughs> um, what made kind of that trio so special? Well, everybody had their own particular skill set, right? I was a team leading scorer. Mm -hmm. I was putting up 25 plus points a game. Um, Sean was our leading rebounder. You know, mm -hmm. people felt to realize this guy was out rebounding me and I was trying to snag every rebound I could. Um, so, and Boris was our versatile kind of point forward guy who would pass the ball as if he's a point guard around. And so that trio of big men and forwards was something that was, very versatile. You couldn't you couldn't mm -hmm. figure us out, and then obviously Nash being the floor general uh, with us helped us as well. But it was just it was just you know hard to figure us out. You know you got myself who were attacking and, and being very dominant in, in my own right, and then Sean being versatile with, with speed and agility, and then Boris being that playmaker. Um, Two thousand seven was an incredible year for us, and I think that might have been our best year. Why did Coach D'Antoni take you out of the game after you hit the go-ahead bucket in game five against the Spurs, which led to the hip check, the Ori hip check, and obviously you being out of the game, you know, that the bullshit suspension, but why were you, why'd you get taken out of the game? I, I never understood that. Uh, it was a coach decision, you know. Uh, I'm not totally sure why. I think, you know, coach might have wanted to have a, a defensive um, team out there, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but obviously, you know, me, I'm a competitive guy. I want to play every minute. Um, and so, you know, we're not sure why that happened, but the hip check was was brutal. You know what I'm saying? I had never seen nothing like that before in the game. I thought Nash was really hurt. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, yeah, I mean, once and, and for us as myself and Boris, we've never really heard of the rule of not being able to step on the court. We've never heard of it. We was only young players. Boris is from France. I'm from the mm -hmm. high school. We've never heard of it. You know, you can't step on the basketball court. Um, so it was a tough, tough ruling. Fast forward in a couple of years. So 2008, you lose to the Spurs in round one. 2009, you missed the playoffs. But that was also kind of a wonky year in the West And that any other year you would have made the playoffs. That's when Shaq's there. And 2010, another pivotal game, the Artes putback. Again, you're not on the floor. So the two probably maybe the most defining plays of, of that Suns era, for some reason you were on the floor and it, it didn't swing your way. Um, when you look back just at your son's tenure, do you think that's the best collective group that never won a championship? I mean, we hear about the early 2000s Kings, might hear about the Durant-Westbrook Thunder, uh, the Blazers in the early 2000s were really good, but do you think that that group is the best collective group you know, you say the Nash and Sotomayor sons, and I'll throw Marion in there too, to to not get over that hump. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you got you got to keep in mind we we faced a lot. I mean, that was also during the era where we had you know Tim Donahue who was who was you know officiating games and mm -hmm. and a lot of our games in the playoffs that he officiated that didn't go our way through the, through the calling. Um, mm -hmm. And so he, you know, and so a lot a lot a lot that took place during that during that time of us trying to compete for a championship. But I do think that, you know, with with our team, we were capable of winning the championship. We could have won a championship, uh, but things just didn't swing our way. Do you guys like obviously the ref thing kind of came out years later. Was there any discussion in the locker room or in the league that this might be happening before you guys knew it? Or was it just like who would ever? Yeah, have man, ever we no, absolutely, <laughs> bro. Yeah, for sure. There was times where I, I would get these foul calls would happen on me. 
in the first quarter. I'm like, what is going on? But this can't be, you know, and you can't really say much to the ref because you get technical foul. You might get, Mm -hmm. you know, they might be more aggressive on you. But we're like, hey, man, something ain't right. Like, we keep getting these calls against us. I'm not, you know, and and so you can't say nothing to the media because the NBA will find you. So it's like, you know, and then years later we hear that this guy was cheating the games and and he was – purposely calling fouls on key players to to change the outcome of the game. And Nash and I was like, what the, we knew something was going on. You know what I'm saying? Like, Oh my God. And so, you know, and we were a team that were destined to win a championship and all these things happened to us, man. It was very unfortunate. Did you even watch the documentary that they, they put out a few years ago about it or you can't, don't even, don't even bother yeah, watching. I, I saw it, man. I saw it and I'm looking at it and I'm like, this is, this is exactly what I was experiencing. I we we've per- firsthand experienced that we you you see you see on the documentary the Suns team being affected by the officiating you see in clips of our games being affected by the officiating and it's all during a time when we were destined to win a championship and unfortunately um, you know it happened the way it happened. It's crazy how far the league has come and that today you have like gambling companies sponsoring the league pretty freshly after probably one of the biggest scandals in sports. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would agree. I think that, that those Suns teams were probably pound for pound the best. And also just you guys had different iterations and you banded together. So, I, I mean, I think there's still obviously a ton to be proud of, but especially when you factor in the the ref factor, that just, that sucks. It's, t- it's yeah, just man. tough. Um, so going forward, you signed with the Knicks in the summer of 2010. This is the big splash summer 2010 with the South Beach big three being formed um me being a Knicks fan that was you know you came at the tail end of a really rough stretch for the Knicks in the mid 2000s that first stint with the Knicks was incredible you brought life back into the garden MVP chance MVP candidates how was that experience your first time out of Phoenix um you must have built really like you know a solid foundation in Phoenix uh, ownership wasn't willing to give you what you deserve, so you choose to go to the Knicks. How was that free agency experience? Were there any other teams other than Phoenix and New York that you were considering? And then just that opening run with the Knicks where you're really tearing through the league. Yeah, man. I mean, obviously my goal was to uh, sign with Phoenix and continue my career with Phoenix. We had a chance mm-hmm. to win. We lost to a Kobe Bryant air ball with a run our test, you know, layup at the buzzer moment. Right, we were so close to to being a championship team, despite the previous years. Um, so my goal that all season was to resign with Phoenix, max contract, right. and then go and then go from there. Mm-hmm. Um, the numbers I put up in the playoffs, that right there is alone in today's game deserves a super max. <laughs> mm-hmm. You see guys, you see guys averaging eighteen points in the playoffs and getting three hundred million. Um, mm-hmm. So, but the idea was to resign with Phoenix and continue to play uh, and retire you know, and continue to play with Nash and, and keep keep that going. Unfortunately, uh, with the ownership at the time, uh, it didn't work out that way. So I wanted to sign with the Knicks, which was which was great for me as well because I wanted to play in New York. Um, I spent time there as my childhood years, and, you know, going back to New York was awesome for me. And then I took on a challenge of wanting to show the world, like, my total skill set, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so when I signed with Phoenix, when I signed with New York, I was able to just to do that, to really show my entire package from ball handling mm-hmm. to perimeter game to inside game, um, leadership qualities on bringing a team that would then make the playoffs to the playoffs and, you know, raising the level of play for all my teammates. That was that was important for me and to show the world that you can play in New York and you can take on this media juggernaut of a place and still be able to have success if you focus on the game of basketball. Um, so all that was in, in in my in my thought process, and to have to have that success, to be the first player to be an All Star starter since Patrick Ewing and these things, mm-hmm. like a team to the playoffs after a ten year uh, uh, deficit, you know, and the MVP chance and, and all these things were were truly remarkable. It must have been amazing. Uh, obviously, the Knicks and, and their fans are, are notorious for just being hard on the team. I, I think they're just really passionate fans. Uh, I think you have so much love from Knicks fans, but were there any stints in your New York career where, you know, you just didn't understand maybe just 
stuff people were saying about you. I talked to Gilbert Arenas and he was adamant. He's like, Knicks fans do it to themselves. The reason that Knicks have not been great for the last how many ever years is because nobody wants to play in a home arena where the fans might boo them. Uh, obviously, it might be a love hate relationship in total. How how do you feel your relationship with with the New York media and the New York fans was because it's not an easy gig. But that means you, that means you're not you're not taking the game serious if you're afraid to play in New York because of mm-hmm. booze, right? If you get booed, that means you're not doing your job. You're not you're not playing at a high level. You're not putting the game first. You know, a lot of times in New York, players get caught up in the fashion, the glamour and glitz, the lights, the entertainment, not focus on the game of basketball. And so, you know, us as New Yorkers and as 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 fans, we look at that. We see, hey, this guy really serious about basketball. Is he improving as a player? Like you mm-hmm. can't go, you can't go right three three years in a row. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, uh, the, the fans of New York are are basketball fans, and they and they see if you're focusing on a game, if you're giving your heart to the game of basketball. So for me, the fans saw my heart, they saw my dedication, they saw my willingness to 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 play through injury and all these things. Um, and so I've never really got a lot of bad um, uh, press from 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 the New York Knicks fans because they mm-hmm. saw my dedication to New York and to the game. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that first season was amazing. Unfortunately, in the playoffs, your back catches up to you um, and you're not at full strength in that Boston series and injuries kind of linger uh, throughout your Knicks career. Um, when you when you when you from your perspective i think you probably got out of the Knicks just in time when things really went south other than health were there any other reasons other than health why the Knicks of the early 2010s didn't work out or or do you think that health was the main factor and and the only factor to look at well i mean health was obviously very important for myself right not being Mm -hmm. able to really give 100 percent and be there 100 percent of the time because I had to deal with certain injuries. Uh, it was mm-hmm. very difficult for me um, at that time and just trying to get used to the training staff and them getting used to my body and how I need to train and so forth. Took a while to really gain that rhythm from that standpoint. And also we had, you know, coaching staff. Mike D'Antoni didn't want to coach anymore because guys weren't buying into the system. Um, and so Coach D'Antoni left and then we brought in Mike Woodson and Mike Woodson was a player, a coach, who was a player coach. You know, he mm-hmm. got the best out of us. We brought in some veteran players uh, from Jason Kidd to Marcus Camby to Kurt Thomas to Rasheed Wallace, guys who mm-hmm. were who knew the game and we played the game the right way. And that was that was a very, very good year for us. Mm-hmm. Um, but then we brought in Mike like, Woodson, uh, you know, got fired. And then we brought in another coaching staff and nobody wanted to buy into that system. And it was just, it was just a mess after that point of not wanting to uh, really buy in. And so I wanted to somewhat continue my last few years uh, on a high note. And mm-hmm. so I was able, I was able to somewhat reconstruct my contract and, and, and to make an exit. I was playing with Sheed. I, I, I've, I've talked to a few players who said he almost became like a coach when he was there. But I mean, loved by the garden, brought the three to the head to it. How was your experience with Sheed? Yeah, Rasheed was awesome, man. I I enjoy playing with Rasheed. He's just he's just a good guy. He knows the game of basketball. Uh, he's a down to earth person, and he gives mm-hmm. it to you straight how it is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Rasheed, yeah, was a guy who started that three to the head thing uh, mm-hmm. from a kid with Lamar song, and so you know, and then Melo then then took it from there and made it made it something special. But yeah, I mean, Rasheed was great to play with. I enjoyed playing with Tyson Chandler. I enjoyed playing with J.R. Smith. You know, I had a really good time playing with Jared Smith. He's one of my favorite teammates that I, I've played with. Mm, um, and also Iman Shumper. You know, I, I really enjoyed playing with those guys, man. Baron Davis, you know, mm-hmm. playing, playing, playing with those players for me was 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 special. And I cherish those moments even to today. What, what's the Kendrick Lamar song that the three to the head came from? It was a song, I think it said do 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 or something. I forget oh, what song okay. it was, but okay. it was like it's like sounds like uh you know, it's, uh, but that song I think was the one, and Rasheed might be able to explain it better. But I think that was the one that kind of get got it through to the head. Uh, I'm going. Uh, your last stop, which I think is forgotten, was the Heat. Really fun team with Dwayne Wade, Goran Dragic, uh, with Joe Johnson on that team too. There wasn't no on that team, no, no Joe Johnson. It was uh, Dragic, Dragic, uh, D Wade, Dragic, Wade uh, Whiteside Bosh. was there. White Bosch side. was there. 
that's the year that Bosch gets his illness catches up to him. Uh, yeah, yeah. You take Toronto to seven, and that would have been great if we got to see like uh, LeBron versus Wade in the conference finals because you would have played the Cavs next. What was that year? Your last year? Um, you know, I think you ended on a pretty high note going to the playoffs, winning a round. How was that year in Miami for you and and being with that that heat culture? It was great. Uh, I was back home, you know, being from Florida. I was yep. Mr. Basketball here in Florida when I was in high school and being drafted from Florida to Phoenix. So so having a full circle moment and coming back home. My home was here in Miami. Uh, so I was local for my family to, to travel to the games easy, easily. But playing that year was great. Playing with D-Wade was, was, was brilliant, you know, because he's such a team player, he's an unselfish mm-hmm. player, and he's very crafty. Like he gets his he gets his stats and he and, and he affects the game in a way that you really don't see often, but it happens. And he, and, and he shows you how good he really is. He was able to have a uh, great um, combination with Hassan Whiteside. Whiteside mm-hmm. was able to have a great year in block shots and scoring, and so we had a really good run. Uh, fortunately, Chris Bosh went down with the with the uh with the injuries that he mm-hmm. um was 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 trying to fight from. Um and I think if Bosch was healthy, we could have made a really decent run to the finals. hmm Uh kind of looking back, um you, you've only been away from the, the game for seven years, but the game has changed so much. I mean, probably the last seven years are are as much as the game has changed in such a span. What are your overall thoughts on, on the league today? Well, I think the league's in a good place. Right. I mean, the, obviously the game is more versatile. I mean, when I started to shoot threes, it was kind of an unknown thing for bigs to shoot threes, so I stopped shooting them. <laughs> uh but but now it's 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 a part of the game. Um uh, I do think that the 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 footwork and the you know the the attention to detail from a fundamental standpoint is somewhat gone from a post perspective. Uh you mm-hmm. do see you do see Joe Gitch who shows a lot of footwork and, and creativity in the post. You do see Joel Embiid um, showing some footwork and creativity in the post, but you don't see a lot of that, those details uh, when it comes to to, to the post game and the mid game, the pull up mm-hmm. jumper. Uh, Devin Booker showed a lot of the fundamental skills when it comes to it, but a lot of players want to shoot a lot of threes, which is okay, but you have mm-hmm. to be versatile and be able to score from all three levels. Mm-hmm. How do you think you would have fared in today's game? Oh man, it would have been the same as I did with Phoenix. You know, yeah. you know, six ten, running the way I run, attack the rim with force. I mean, it reminds me of Giannis in a sense. You know, Giannis kind of uh, when I when Giannis was originally starting out, I think his first or second year, uh, Coach Tim Gergerich was with us in Phoenix. Ended mm-hmm. up going to Milwaukee, and he mm-hmm. pulled me aside. And Giannis, I think, it was nineteen twenty at the time. He's like, "Stat, this player right here," and he brought Giannis over. He said, he "Reminds me of you." You know, and then uh, then next thing you know, a year or two later, this guy's taking over the NBA and he's attacking the rim with force. He's he's dominating. He's grabbing rebounds like you wouldn't believe. He has no fear. And then I was like, yep, Coach Gurry told me about him. He's like, and he's exactly right. Yeah, I think uh, uh, an underrated part of your game is just how many times you went to the free throw line and how aggressive you were. Like, I think you, you probably led the league in free throw attempts a, a few times. But nowadays, people are kind of getting their free throws in different ways, more more crafty ways rather than just going to the basket. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, again, trying to draw and ones. I think there's a moment where I let the league in and ones for like uh-huh. three straight years or something like that. But just being more versatile is key. One thing during your career that I, I forgot to ask you about is is just Nike. You were part of a, a great the second coming campaign, uh, you know, with LeBron, Kobe, Nash was there, Marion. How how is your experience as a Nike athlete? And then more specifically, uh, just your time maybe spending around the the Kobe's and LeBron's of the world. It was brilliant, man. Nike Nike was was a great company to be a part of. I was one of the highest paid big men of all time when I signed my Nike contract with them. Hell yeah. Uh, I was a part of Force, uh, the Nike Force campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, and so being around Kobe and LeBron uh, during those years as a top Nike clients, athletes basically, was, was, was beautiful. I've, I've been a Nike guy my entire career. And so to to you know to work with all the top executives um and having the, the the guidance from from Nike was important for me in my career. Any any memorable trips or campaigns that you were part of that that really stick out to you today that you remember? 
Yeah, we did Nike China. We went to Shanghai. We had a beautiful time there for the Nike Festival. Um, that, that was that was great. All the commercials from the, the Second Coming commercial was awesome. Um, we did, I did the Force commercial out in L.A. and that kind of catapulted my acting skills when I was able mm-hmm. to start to get involved in those commercials and really express my way from a from a from an artistic standpoint. That catapulted my acting career. Mm, that's that's amazing. Uh, just last quick quick hitting correct uh, question. What's your favorite dunk of your career? I mean, you've had a, you've had a bunch of them. I think the Richard Jefferson one stands out. You caught, I think, Anthony Tolliver, Donald Foyle. Which one do you put at the top of the list? The one on the Donald Foyle was awesome because the quote that he made after he was like, "I dedicate the study of science to Amari Stoudemire after that dunk." You know what I'm saying? Like that was like, I was like, man, that's a very thoughtful quote. <laughs> but I think I think probably my favorite uh, my favorite dunk would either be the lob I caught from Kobe Bryant from half court in the All-Star game. Okay. Uh, caught it on one side of the rim and reversed it to the other side. And that was a special moment because Kobe was a special guy, blessed memory. And maybe the uh, the one dunk on Josh Smith in Atlanta yeah. because that was a very forceful, hard, like, you know, attacking the rim dunk. But Tolliver is definitely the one on Anthony Tolliver against Steph Curry and the Warriors. Is probably uh, one of my favorites. Uh, any, you know, when people ask you about Kobe, obviously we could, you know, talk about that forever. But uh, you were around him. You competed against him at the highest level. Played on with him at in the All Star game. You were a Nike athlete. Uh, was there any memory or, or instance from Kobe Bryant that that sticks out to you today? I mean, every time every time we go to the gym, right? I mean, with the USA team, I would get there like six in the morning, which is earlier than everyone else. <laughs> except for Kobe. <laughs> I get into the gym and Kobe's already in the full sweat training and he's going hard. I'm like, man, Kobe, what time? What time did you get here? He's like, man, I've been here like four o'clock, young fella. Like, yeah, this guy's a different animal, man. But he was a very articulate, smart individual. You can tell he, you know, he read a lot. You can tell he was educated. And that's what I took from Kobe the most is that he's not only a basketball player, but he was very, very intelligent as a person as if he was an Ivy League student type of guy. You know what I'm saying? So that is what I, I cherish the most about Kobe, about him being outside of the box of a normal athlete and being an intelligent person, which I thought was very, 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 very good for him. Mm. Rest in peace, Kobe. Uh, well, Mario, I really appreciate your time, man. Uh, again, we'll, we'll look forward to seeing you go up in the rafters in Phoenix. Well-deserved congratulations and uh, wish you all, all the best. Thank you, brother. All the best to you. Appreciate it.